make St. Joe and St. Joe of the Y a faithful and welcoming congregation. Make it a fearless summer. Take the four people mission team survey. You can gain a paper copy of the mission center at your place of worship, complete the survey in the e-news, it's available online on the four people page, or scan the QR code that's currently on the screen. This will help create a database of fearless volunteers when needs in our community arise for service in painting, lawn work, transportation, childcare, and so much more. Make it a fruitful summer by volunteering with Taya Aldrin Ash to help support grace and kindness devotional times with the YMCA summer camps. Ask about it at the mission center at your place of worship. For families, keep your eyes open for dates and times when there are summer Sunday gatherings, pop-up events, by making sure you are signed up for the email and on our website. Keystones? Keep track of your emails, too, for lunch bunch, game days, pickleball, and so much more. Mark your calendars for a new Millennium Jazz Band concert on June 30th at Praise Park from 5 to 7 p.m. Proceeds from this event will benefit the choir trip to Carnegie Hall this fall. And to all, on Sunday, July 7th, we will be in one service at Praise Park, all of us together at 10 a.m. Faithful, fearless, and fruitful for the Lord. Welcome to worship, and welcome to summer at St. Joe and St. Joe at the Wild. Well, thank you so much again for being here this morning. We've got a couple of songs of worship for you. We'll pray, and then we'll eat some food. How's that sound? Amen.
Let's begin with a word of prayer. God, we come to you this day and we ask that you would bless the food to our bodies and us to your service. And, oh God, we ask that you would meet us in our conversation around these tables, that you would send us also from this place. With that thing animating us, which is the thing that calls us all together, the thing that guides our lives and our hearts, a trust in Christ Jesus. With that thing carrying us out into the world and being given away to others. Oh God, on this day we pray for families as they celebrate a holiday week. We acknowledge the sacrifice of those who have served their country. And we repent and ask, O oh Lord, that there would be need for war no more, even as we acknowledge their service. O oh God, won't you meet us with your justice, meet us with your peace, meet us with your perfect love in Christ Jesus, and again, O oh Lord, send us from this place with it, to our friends, our relatives, our acquaintances, our neighbors, our colleagues, our families. In Jesus' name, amen. What does that have to do with church? Uh, that's something you can wonder from time to time. Have you ever had an experience where you thought, what does this have to do with church? You're doing something around church. And then it's either tragically, humorously, uh, terribly, infuriatingly, the question comes to you, what does this have to do with church? I served a church that ran a hog roast for decades. I think they started it before Lincoln was in the White House. <laughs> it was a serious hog roast. They did it the whole way. This was no, no buying pork loins at Kroger. <laughs> No, this, they got the whole hog, and they put it in the cooker. It would cook overnight. People would stay up. They, they made the sauce from scratch in large cauldrons that were stirred for days, making the barbecue sauce the special secret recipe. One day, long before my time there, a, a smaller, older lady came in, one of the saints of the church. She was game. She had a good attitude. She'd give as good as she got. She was fun to be with, but she came in to get her carry-out order. And one of the guys in the kitchen was kind of a rascal. And so he thought, I'll know what I'll do to her. And so he went and he found the tail of the pig. Because like I said, they cook down the whole hog, and there comes a point as you pull that pulled pork off that the tail falls off and it had been set aside, and he went and got the tail. He got the buns, he put the pigtail in the buns. He put it in her carryout. The whole time he's laughing to himself. I'm so funny. <laughs> she goes out with her carryouts in the bags. She has no idea what's happening. And as she leaves, he says, Hey, hey, you guys won't guess what I just did. Oh, he thought he was funny. He says, 12 minutes. She'll be home, she'll open that, she'll be back here in 12 minutes, that's the time. And he sat down on the stool, laughing. Oh, he thought he was funny. And he watched the clock. Sure enough, 12 minutes pass, and right on the nose, the door from the outside into that church kitchen swung open with a vengeance, and in stepped Miss Pearl, revolver in hand. There were no bullets in it. <laughs> but he didn't know that. And over the stool he tumbled and out the door like lightning, and of course everybody broke up laughing. But then you start to wonder when you get home, what does this have to do with church? <laughs> what does this have to do with church? Now we know we need fun times. We need time. We did roller skating last weekend, roller dome, some of us, that's great. Yeah. Uh, there was lunch bunch for some folks last weekend. Yeah, we know we need those times of fellowship and fun and frivolity. But of course, we've all been in situations that were either fun and frivolous and fellowship or infuriating or tragic when we just step back and say, what does this have to do with church? So as you go and get your food this morning, I want you to think about that when you get back and eat, start sharing some stories about what was a time that you were just like, what does this have to do with church? Because that's going to help us prepare to think about why church anyway? 
Okay. Okay. Food time. Let's eat. Get food. Tell each other about a time you thought, what does this have to do with church? <laughs>
Okay, did you come up with any stories? Did you come up with any situations where you thought, what does this have to do with church that you could remember? Or were you just talking about other stuff? Anyone? 
one. So they had like a dance, like a social well, thing. Yeah, kind of like a bar, like this size of the room, but it was basically. Uh huh. Lower oh, ceiling. You brought my right camera. <laughs> <laughs> and, every, and you saw people like, I can't believe it. What fun we had. So they were all like, just Okay, so they had like a youth thing, and, and it was fun, but then Sunday morning the youth weren't there. Well, the you, same just, numbers. you just didn't see the kids. Yeah. Because they were the worst But yeah. Okay, okay. Kathy? We had a fashion show. A fashion show. Yes. I feel like that's happened somewhere we were also, that they did like a fashion show for like a Mother's Day tea or something. And, and why? Why, are, why? What does this have to do with church? And some of them wore, had somebody wear their wedding dress. Some of them wore their wedding dresses. Yeah, yeah. If it didn't fit them, yes. <laughs> like, you know. That took an odd turn, yeah, didn't it? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Here's my promise. To, I can't always, I don't always like to get painted into a corner, Kathy. I don't like to say never under any circumstances. Will it, but on that one, I will say, we're not doing a wedding dress fashion show at St. <laughs> Joe or St. Joe's. You're not doing it. Was Anybody was. else? You thought, what is this about? Why, what does this have to do with church? I didn't think I could think of anything. Back when I was a teenager, so this is the way back, we were in a church, and, and after we had our supper before youth group meeting, we would go into one of the classrooms and dance, and it was rock and roll. Oh. So, not rock and roll like you think of now. The rockers weren't around yet. We actually held hands and, and danced. <laughs> but it was an inner connection thing. More like a, more like a, oh, where, oh, where could my baby be? Like that kind of thing? <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> She's not talking about that in front of Larry. <laughs> Okay. So the second pastor thought that apparently that had nothing to do with church, and maybe even that was an evil. I don't know. Yeah. Oh, but yeah. For us, it was a connection, and you know, we're all so shy, uncoordinated, well, and, and just silly. But we were having fun together. Yeah, Lizzie. You couldn't see it. Like what? I'm gonna have to come closer. You went to a 90s or 80s rock concert? Okay. So, yeah, because you never went to a concert in the 80s or 90s. <laughs> no, I didn't think so. <laughs> so sometimes you can go as a church to something and think, is this really edifying why we're here or something like that? Okay. I would say one more time, Father. We did sister act. They did a, the musical Sister Act. Yes. So much fun. Great. I don't know why. There's some good stuff that's church-related in that, I guess. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, in all these things, um, we're, we're asking, we, we kind of get the sense that what does this really have to do with church or not? Um, and we kind of have to go back and say, well, why are we doing it? Uh, what's the purpose of why we're here and why we gather as a church? That's really what happens in, at the essence of this. And a lot of these are kind of like events that we did that we're programming that maybe we need to think back through again and think like, okay, how do we connect the dots here? That's something that happens a lot, that we get doing something and it's fun, or we start repeating something that at the beginning had a purpose, but over time the kind of main purpose is lost. But to, to have that sense, it's not just a, like I know it when I see it thing, we have to kind of have a sense of what the main purpose for why we're here and why church at all anyway. That's what we're going to be thinking about for the next few weeks. To help us think about that, we start with a text that's one of the most uh, well-known texts in the world. And in all of Christendom, it comes from John chapter 3. 
And it begins with a guy by the name of Nicodemus, who is a leader in the temple, in the Jewish leadership there in Jerusalem, and he comes to Jesus. But what we'll see is he doesn't get it. And neither do we. There's a Pharisee named Nicodemus, John 3, verse 1, a Jewish leader, and he came to Jesus at night. This little detail at night should not be overlooked, because in John's Gospel, all the time, John is talking about light and dark with great significance. You'll remember John chapter 1 starts in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And shifts very quickly to talking about Jesus not only as Word, but as light, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. John's Gospel never throws away light and dark. It's always used on purpose as a metaphor for something going on. Some have said Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night because he doesn't want to be found out. doesn't want anybody to know he's talking to Jesus. I think a better argument looking at the Gospel of John is this is John's way of signaling to us Nicodemus doesn't get it. Nick doesn't get it. He doesn't understand what Jesus is up to. He comes to him at night and he says, Rabbi, we know you're a teacher who has come from God. For no one could do these miraculous signs that you do unless God is with you. Jesus answered, I assure you, unless someone is born anew, it's not possible to see God's kingdom. This is a great text that can serve for us as a cautionary tale about why we ought not take Jesus too literally sometimes. Always taking him seriously, always taking scripture seriously, but a literal understanding here gets Nicodemus into a little bit of trouble. Verse 4, he asks, How is it that an adult can be born again? It's impossible to enter the mother's womb for a second time and be born, isn't it? Now look, I don't think Nicodemus is that much in the dark. I think that's what you call a rhetorical question. Jesus answered, I assure you, unless someone is born of water and spirit... It's not possible to enter God's kingdom. Whatever is born of flesh is flesh, and whatever is born of spirit is spirit. Don't be surprised that I said to you, you must be born anew. God's spirit blows wherever it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you don't know where it's coming from or where it's going. And it's the same with those who are born of the spirit. Here we're starting to get a taste, aren't we, of the very purpose for the ministry of Jesus. That God could come to humanity and begin to do new things in them. Things that set people free from the bondage of their own selfishness, from the patterns and structures that we find ourselves born into quite naturally. Setting us free for something else. But verse 9, Nicodemus admits it. He says, how are these things possible? And Jesus answered and in a way that sounds like he's speaking even to us. You're a teacher of Israel and you don't know about these things? I assure you that we speak about what we know and testify about what we've seen, but you don't receive our testimony. If I've told you about earthly things and you don't believe, how do you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has gone up to heaven except the one who came down from heaven, the human one, or some translations will say the Son of Man, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so much the human one, or the Son of Man, be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. And now we come to those verses, those verses that we've seen indicated on the eyelids of football players, those verses that we have seen marked on billboards along the interstate, that we have turned into bumper stickers, and in so doing, trivialized in our lives and in our world, but they're powerful verses. Jesus goes on to explain what God's up to. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him won't perish, but will have eternal life. God didn't send his son into the world to judge the world, but the world might be saved through him. And in this moment, and in two verses, Jesus gives a description of what God as community and God as unity is up to. He gives the picture of a God who is sending, the one he calls Abba, our Father, sending him. The Son, he himself, who is going to be lifted up so that everybody else can be drawn up with him. And a spirit that is exchanged between God the Father 
and between Jesus, which is sent to us. You see why we'd say that Jesus is describing God as community, but also as a unity? And what he's describing is that this God comes to us, and when we trust in this God, that something new happens in our life, something fresh happens in our life, and through that trust, the old things begin bit by bit to fall away, and something new is happening. It doesn't mean it's a done deal. It means perhaps we have to find it again and again and again through failure and trust and failure and trust. But here is the thing that is coming. This is what he's told. To understand this Nicodemus, this God who comes to us in community and unity, you're going to have to start over. And God wants to start over with you. Now, we can hear this message, and we can think, well, that's all good and well, but how does it actually work? Isn't there a gap between this God who's doing this and what I experience in my life? How do we bridge that gap? There's a guy by the name of Cyprian who talks about salvation. Cyprian, living in the year 250, you don't hear a lot of children named Cyprian nowadays. Cyprian would say, extra ecclesia nulla salus, for those of you who are uninitiated in Latin. It meant there is no salvation outside the church. Now, that's been interpreted a lot of different ways. I think, I think if we give Cyprian a very charitable reading, what he would argue is the church is that which bridges the gap between that community and unity of God and our lives. I mean, just think about it practically. Have you come to know this God in Jesus Christ in your life? If you have, think about how that happened. That necessarily required the church in some way, I would bet. Because there had to be somebody who was shaped by that to bring that message to you. Now, that doesn't mean that we need necessarily bishops and priests and pastors it doesn't necessarily mean that we need some of the things we think we need when we talk about church, and we know that here at the Y. There is no stained glass, no organ. But there is community, there is unity, there is a group of people who are enacting on earth the life of God in a community and in a unity so that other people can find God's Spirit meeting them and so that they can start over so they can be born afresh so they can be born again why church that's why now you may be sitting out there today and saying uh, preacher i think you're working a little too hard this morning this doesn't seem like that big a problem but i'm not the first the apostle paul who was the one was puzzling about this thing too how could this life of god become real in our lives what bridges the gap it's in romans 10 that he says this, quoting other scripture. The scripture says, all who have faith in him won't be put to shame. There's no distinction between Jew and Greek. Because the same Lord is Lord of all, who gives richly to all who call on him. All who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. So how can they call on someone they don't have faith in? And how can they have faith in someone they haven't heard of? And how can they hear without a preacher? And when he says that, he's not talking about me or anyone else with a wonderful horn of hair. He's talking about you all. You know that, right? How can they preach unless they are sent as it is written? How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Why church? The church bears the good news of God starting over with us again and again and again. This week... We had David Fitch in town from Northern Seminary. We did this in partnership with our friends at the YMCA. Wednesday morning, we had a group of uh, almost 25 pastors and Christian leaders down at Ren Point Y. Uh, Wednesday night, we had a small group at St. Joe. Uh, Thursday morning, small group of pastors down at Mission House uh, with Associated Churches. And by Thursday morning, David Fitch, who had been talking with us about how we use godly power and avoid worldly power, 
how we avoid talking in ways about ideology. We all think the same way, right? Yes, let's all cheer for our team. That's power of a worldly variety. We don't want to do that. We don't want to do things that put me on a pedestal above you or Pastor Ashley on a pedestal above you. How do we live with your clergy submitting to you? This kind of stuff, right? We talked about that. By Thursday, we were talking about what does it mean for the church as a whole to live in this way using God's power for its purpose in the world. And Fitch talked about an understanding of church that included these three circles that we're going to talk about in the weeks ahead more. The first was an understanding of the church as a close circle. <clears throat> Didn't say closed circle. The church is an open circle. There ought to be an amen for that. Okay, yeah. No, not a closed circle, a close circle. That's like us here today. We're eating a meal together, we're gathered around the table. Sometimes that table has bread and wine on it. Always it has the Word of God on it. These ways we nurture each other together in a faithful community. The church exists like that, as church, like this, right? God's people together, they're breaking bread, they're sharing they're in God's Word together. It exists in that way. But the church doesn't just exist in that way. It exists in neighborhoods and in homes. There are times we ought to be getting together, getting to know each other. To use the colloquial phrase, doing life together. But there's truth in that, right? I don't know. I just kind of, that phrase kind of, I don't know. But I get what it's getting at, right? We do life together. And the church exists there, too. Sometimes the church exists at the roller dome, and sometimes at lunch bunch, and sometimes at other things that you're like, why is this church? Oh, because the church is always carrying that trust in God through Jesus Christ from one place to the next. All the way to the other place the church exists, which is out in the community. Taking that message of a God who wants to start over with us out to other people. This is a coffee shop. You can't really tell. But you could have put Jackson Lehman YMCA. The church exists in all of these places. For it to be a church that is enacting again the life of God, the community of God, the unity of God. To help people start over, to help people be born afresh, born again, born anew. That's how it has to live. And that's why we have church. So that it can enact that life of God here in our world. But it's so easy to forget, isn't it? Uh, I graduated, you don't have to move that. I graduated high school. Twenty-one years ago. <coughs> yeah, I know, not that long. Twenty-one years ago, I graduated high school. You get high school graduation presents. It's okay, Nan. Can somebody get Nan some help? Nan needs help now. Someone resuscitate her. When you graduate high school, often you get like open house and people come and they give you presents. And I had a lot of people come to mind. Not because I was popular, but because it was a small town, small community, people were close to me, lots of people. I got, I got gifts by the hundred, and, and most of the time, what do you give? Gift cards. Gift cards. Not so much 21 years ago. <laughs> Cash. Checks. Uh, I'll take a cashier's check, a money order. No, I, no. <laughs> you know, people give cash. Uh, there's some other things people would give, this or that. Uh, I don't remember any of the amounts people gave me except for two who gave enough that I still kind of remember how much it was. <laughs> but the cash was gone quick. Can I get an amen? amen. Yeah. <laughs> and nothing else really kept, but I was given this thing, too. And this I still have. It's made more than six moves. Packed up in boxes and unpacked again. It sits in my study at the church. So there was one couple that was a part of the church I grew up in. And when I graduated high school, this was in there. Probably some $8 tchotchke when they were on vacation. And they just threw it in the bag thinking, oh, I know what I'll do. 
But they gave it to me, and it had a note with it. And the note said, Glenn, never forget who your lighthouse is. They knew why they were there in my life. It's so easy to forget. Why are we here? Why are we church? Why do we do what we do? Why do we not do some things? Because we have been given this call to be that community of people that are reenacting the life of God, that are taking the good news of trust and belief in Jesus Christ, so that they, in their lives, can start over. And so that we and ours can start over again and again. Before we leave here today, I want you to think about and discuss what are the ways we can keep that at the center of everything we're doing. How do we do that? How next time we go to roller though, do we keep that at the center? How when somebody walks through the front door of JRL and grabs out there sitting or milling around at the door, how does he keep that thing in mind? Uh, How do we keep that in mind when Momco is meeting with mothers or when Mark is out cleaning and wiping down elliptical machines and helping people understand how to, how do we keep that in the center? How do we keep it in mind in our jobs, whether they be at a school or at the Mission and Rescue Center, how do we keep it at the center as church Why we're here? You guys get to discuss that, and then I think Austin's going to give us a little wrap-up before we leave here today. So take a few minutes to discuss that. How do we keep that at the center in what we're here? trust in Jesus Christ so they can start anew and afresh and again in their lives at the center. How do we do that? Like, if I were to give you a cheat sheet a little bit, like one thing we do on the leadership side, staff and church council, is we have our vision and our values. We want to be a church to support the fort, faithfully understanding and opening the scripture and teaching of Jesus together. Fearlessly as led by the Holy Spirit in costly relationships of real love, right? And fruitful and inviting our friends and neighbors to transformation. And so on the leadership level, we're always going back, aren't we, Jerry? On church council, we say, is this really fitting? Is this what we're supposed to do? We remind ourselves of that. That's one way we do it. How do you all do it as you are church? How do you keep that the main thing? There you go. I'm <laughs> 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 <la
In public? Yeah. <laughs> this is really like, So she knows when she does like show up. Sometimes when I, I choose songs, um, I can't come up with one, so I'll be like, oh, I haven't done that one in a while, that sounds fun. Uh, this is kind of one of those cases, and then every time I was just sitting over there in the corner being all quiet, and I was like, God just did it again, connects everything together, he always does. Um, it's kind of this little story Glenn was talking about the lighthouse, and I, I, well, I picked this song on this this morning because I couldn't fit it any other set before and after it. And, it was the National Day of Prayer a couple weeks ago, and I, I did this song, and, and Glenn said something nice to me about it, and it kind of stuck with me. And, um, I think that, plus Glenn's story, is a good reminder of being intentional with our words, being intentional with our actions to people around us. You have no idea what someone else is going through, and the smallest little act of kindness you do can have a massive, lasting impression um, on people. And uh, the, the question that Glenn was asking about, about Going into, going into situations and how we can be the church and the community, I think the song fits really well for it, because my answer for that, again, would be the song title, which is Gratitude. Um, uh, definitely something that we should be thankful for when we walk into situations and think about what people have done for us in the past and have gratitude over that, um, entering into those conversations, into those actions with a heart and a posture of gratitude. I think really helps uh, let us overflow, as in the idea of our cup overflowing into others, which then creates that community, that church that we talked about. At previous places, we've always called it the Big C Church. So, I thought that was kind of a cool little thought I had in the corner um, about all of that. The little story I had, I don't know if any of you have heard of this one. Um, Jack, you can go ahead and get started with that. Thank you. Uh, is it was a story about a little boy who was walking along the beach, and there were a bunch of uh, like little sand dollars, like starfish, well not starfish, but I don't know what their actual name is, little sand dollar things. There are hundreds of them along the beach, and he kept picking them up and throwing them back in the ocean one at a time. Uh, and someone came along and said, why are you doing that? You're wasting your time. There's thousands of them. You're not able to save them all. He picked one up, threw it in the water, turned to the 
other guy is uh, the matter to that one. And that little story had always stuck with me for a long time. Um, I think kind of when you go back to the gratitude thing, I think that's something we need to keep in mind um, when, when being the church, the big C church in the community.